So my name's Aaron Liebtag, and I'm one of the co-founders of Pentabeer. And I was really hoping to start tonight by asking my partner, Steve, to put up his hand. Fortunately, Steve had a family obligation and had to go. But Steve's mother went to the hospital with a broken ankle. And the cast was put on a little bit too tight. And the information that she needed to be on blood thinners was buried. And Steve's mother never made it out of the hospital. Now, Steve spent 20 years in the financial service industry building real-time pricing systems for hedge funds and insurance companies. And he said, I'm going to make a change in my life. We know in healthcare we need to do better. And there's not a day that goes by where we don't read or hear about the transformative impact that AI and machine learning is going to have. Yet in order for AI to have impact, in order for machine learning models to predict accurately, we need data. And despite drowning in data, in healthcare, 80% of the health information we create is not used to improve healthcare. It's not used to improve efficiencies, it's not used to improve care, and it's not used to save lives. And the reason for that is because that critical healthcare information is buried. It's buried in what we like to call unstructured data or unstructured clinical narratives. It's buried in the progress notes that physicians write for themselves. It's buried in the transcription text that they speak to themselves when they want to know how do I treat or how do I want to know the history of that particular patient. And it's buried in all of the digitized forms and documents that are so pervasive within our healthcare system. And I'm so excited to be able to demo for you the first time is we've developed technology that's been validated at St. Michael's Hospital in partnership with the Biomedical Zone that extracts features and structures and transforms this unstructured data into row and column data sets. Can everybody see that note? Because that note is representative of the 80% of information that currently isn't used to improve health outcomes. It's filled with spelling mistakes, shorthands, but it's also filled with a tremendous amount of clinical information. And if we run that note through my system, you can see all of the clinical content in that note has been transformed into row and column data sets. So now think of every row as a clinical feature and each column as a property of that clinical feature. So we've got information on a patient and we know that that patient is male, 72 years, from South Africa. And we also know that that patient is dealing with a certain hardship in terms of underhousing. And that's really important information to know and to understand. We know that that patient has taken a number of labs and diagnostic tests. Notice the coding. We extract every single clinical feature and link that to international ontologies, whether it's SNOMED, ICD, or MeSH. I'm going to change the view of the data because we're going to look at the data as I speak to a little bit of the functionality of the system and how we traditionally look at what a structured medical record looks like. And I want to take you back to what the source of that data is. 72M, South African, if you notice, we changed it from the adjectival to the noun because our goal is to create the most pristine, standardized row and column data set that we can either do analysis on, our physician partners can do analysis on, or we can actually pass on structured, curated data to partners in this ecosystem so they can move forward their agenda, they can move forward their initiative. If you look here, we notice that there was an A1C score done, but take a notice of the date. A1C score, March 2017, and then there's an EKG in January 2017. Again, if we look at what the source does in terms of functionality of the system, is it's able to read, uh, saw his cardiologist two months ago, EKG normal. We're able to take that two months ago, how we read documents, reference that back to the note of the particular uh, progress note, and we're able to reference that and structure that accordingly. We've got diseases, we've got drugs, and we normalize all of the dose, root, frequency to a standard format. So again, that data can be as pristine as possible. Now I want to share with you uh, a use case we did at St. Michael's Hospital around opioid disorders because it's such a pervasive, horrible issue that we're dealing with in our society. So part of the validation work we did is we went through 85,000 records and extracted 76 unique features from those records. And one of the things they asked us to do was, can you help us predict who would or would not be at risk of having an opioid disorder. 
And we extracted out certain things like socioeconomic factors, certain things like notations of double doctoring, information that just doesn't exist in the fielded formats that we are so reliant on for data sets to be able to do all the things we know we can do with machine learning. Now one of the features that they thought would be a slam dunk was this concept of daily morphine equivalent because they actually implemented a system in their workflow where you as a physician will go in and, and take note of all the other opioids that that patient is on. It's going to shoot out a number and then you're supposed to take that number and put that into the EMR for reference. You can imagine less than 2% of the physicians actually did that. I'm going to give you, show you a quick example of what those notes look like. Again, if you were to look at notes like, just close this, if you were to look at notes like that and say, which patients are or are not at risk of having an opioid disorder? Or how can I visualize that data and do an analysis on that data? It's not in a format that we can use. But if we run that through our engine, and I update it, in real time, all of the drugs are extracted. All of the root dosage and frequency is normalized. And we added another property, that notion of daily morphine equivalent. Because to understand how much morphine is actually in Tylenol-3 and build that property into your algorithms, although difficult, is an easier part of the problem. And what that enabled us to do was to start creating visualizations like this by patient in terms of who is or who is not exceeding a certain morphine, daily morphine equivalent, what diseases do they have, what medications are they on, and the list is endless. Now, what's in this data when we unleash it is incredible, because right now what's in this data is helping researchers reimagine triggers to reduce emergency department visits for patients on active chemotherapy. Social conditions, if you're a single mother who doesn't have the support and is having one of these horrible side effects, well, you're going to the emergency department not just with yourself but with your kid. How do we reduce that bad information? is in this data. We're helping market access teams better understand mental health treatments and mental health comorbidities in order to improve compliance and to improve health outcomes. And we believe, and what propels us forward every day is we believe that possibly in this data could have been the information that could have saved my partner Steve's mother's life. Now I wanted to end by thanking another partner. Uh, that's been so critical to our ability to be able to show this demo to you today. And when Maggie opened this up and she said, who in this room is involved in this ecosystem in terms of starting a company, being part of a startup, or relentlessly pursuing a research initiative you have hoping that that experiment is going to work out? Because those of you who are, we know it's tough. It's hard. It takes grit and tenacity. The highs are high and the lows are lows and there's more tough days than there are good days. So the second partner I wanna thank is my life partner, my wife, because I believe in this ecosystem for us to do what we do, we need those partners, those life partners beside us. They're standing beside us for us to lean on. They're standing behind us, holding us up and at times lifting us up. And we talk a lot about the journey. We talk a lot about the tech that we're able to produce. But I can tell you that I'm not alone, but I can look out in terms of this room and know that each and every one of you who are on your own journeys, part of this community, building a company that is hopefully going to improve our healthcare system, um, we have those partners, whether it's friends, it's family, it's spouse, uh, who's helping us along the way. And I think we need to acknowledge those partners, acknowledge those people, because they're just as important in the innovations that we're talking about and everybody in this room is working so hard on. And uh, that's how I'd like to end the presentation. Thank you so much.